Hey everyone, I want to take a little bit of time today and talk about a couple of topics that seem to be causing some confusion out there in the real world. So I get questions about these things all the time and I haven't found any great videos here on YouTube to talk about what the differences are uh, between timecode and genlock. And then I also want to do a brief mention of word clock at the end because that's kind of a similar concept, something you might encounter uh, as you're working on with, working with audio. So yeah, genlock and... Uh, time timecode are not the same thing at all and unfortunately people confuse the two and can not only confuse the two assuming that they might be the same thing but also that one can take the place of the other and they really can't they're they're very very different things so even though they're both synchronization signals they have very different purposes and very different uses uh, so I'm trying to clear up some of that confusion here today so I wanted to cover genlock first, and then I'll get into timecode here in a little bit. But genlock is basically a signal that's used to tell video equipment, specifically usually cameras and playback devices like uh, video media players or whatever, how, and off, how often and when to output the video information. So it's a timing signal to basically make sure that all of your video devices that are going into a switcher are outputting their video simultaneously. So for example, the upper left pixel, pixel 00, uh, x comma y, is output at the same time on all connected devices. And the reason for that, uh, well originally had to do with the way we did things back in the analog days before a device called a frame sync. A frame sync was actually something that was very common. So what happened was your video switchers would, instead of buffering the video data coming in, you would make sure that all your cameras were timed the same, so that the same position on the screen from every camera was being received at the same time. And therefore, when you needed to switch cameras or you needed to dissolve from one camera to another, you can just do that very cleanly. You don't have to worry about where in the course of drawing the picture the camera is because if you have the cameras gen lock they're all outputting the same portion of the picture at the same time therefore to switch from one to the other is very very easy because they're all timed and lined up exactly the same in the digital world that we have today it's not as necessary to do that because most of the switchers that we have now actually have frame syncs built into them and what happens with that is internally the switcher will buffer will hold on to that picture data until it needs to output it. So if your cameras are not synchronized, the switcher will store that information temporarily in a buffer, and then the next time it needs to start drawing or outputting a video frame, it's able to pull from the buffer instead of requiring the camera be at that exact same location as what it's trying to output. So if you're outputting pixel 0, comma 0, you don't have to make sure that the cameras are all sending picture at zero comma zero. The, the frame, frame, frame synchronizer that's built into the switcher actually takes care of that. And on almost all video switchers that we have, uh, digital high definition actually do have frame syncs built into them. So it's much less necessary today to have genlock cameras than it was back in the day, but there is still one very distinct advantage, and that is in reducing the amount of latency that there is from the time light enters the camera until it's output from out to the back of the switcher and sent to a display device like a television or a projector. So if you're in a situation where you're doing iMag, image magnification, which is basically the terminology for displaying what's going on live at an event on a projector screen within the venue, you want to minimize that delay as much as possible because if it's more than say two to three frames people that are watching are going to see that and then notice it and it's kind of distracting to have what's going on on screen be delayed by much compared to what's actually happening in real life so going with a gen locked source allows you to eliminate that buffering that's happening on the inputs of the switcher and it basically allows the video coming from the camera to be passed straight out to the back of the switcher in real time without that additional delay that's required when your frame information, your video frame information is not synchronized. What does it take to do this? Uh, we need a few pieces of equipment in order to do this. First of all, we need to have a device which generates a synchronization signal. And this signal is our genlock signal. So gen, genlock means generator locked, which basically referring to the fact that our cameras and switcher are locked or synchronized to our video timing generator, so our genlock source. And I happen to have one of those here in front of me. This is an old black burst generator that I've had for, oh gosh, maybe 20 years, close to 20 years. 
Uh, this device on the back has six BNC outputs, and these signals coming out of this are what we call black burst. It's also referred to as bi-level sync. And so basically, this, this signal is there to tell the cameras, the switcher, and playback devices, recorders, that kind of thing, when to start outputting each frame, of, not just each frame, but each actual line, horizontal line of video as well. So this device is generating that signal that all of the connected devices actually need. Now this is a device that's meant for standard definition and the signal coming out of here is actually just a picture that's completely black. So there's no picture information there at all. It's basically the synchronization signals that are used as part of de uh, describing a picture in the analog world. So in this case it's NTSC. This is the device that we would use, one of the potential devices that we would use in a studio setting or whatever in order to produce that synchronization signal that our cameras and our switcher and our playback devices and anything else would need. So what I've done is I've hooked the output of this up to this oscilloscope that's over here and then I'm going to take, display the output of this oscilloscope on your screen. So if we go over to this, here we're seeing the output of this black burst generator. Now, this, as mentioned, this is a standard definition signal. So, and this is NTSC, so it's outputting 525 lines. Um, there's no horizontal picture resolution technically, but yes, it's a, so it's a signal that's 525 lines. And this signal that we're seeing right here on screen is being output 525 times per frame at 60 fields per second. 30 frames per second or 60 fields per second. So this signal is actually being generated quite quite quickly. And what you're seeing here, if uh, look at that, this pulse down here is basically telling the cameras and whatever, this is when I want you to start a new line of video. And then this signal right here that you're seeing is kind of flickering back and forth. This is what we call the color burst. It's basically a timing signal for all devices to make sure that they're in sync and as far as outputting the color information that's part of a video. Now in high definition, even though we can use these old standard definition black burst devices in order to sync our, sync our cameras and switchers, our devices are not using that color timing information. Back in the day, you would, you would use this in order to make sure that the subcarrier that's used for describing the color portion of uh, an image was all in sync with all the cameras and switcher uh, because if it wasn't you would find that colors would drift you would be displaying the wrong hues things wouldn't look quite right so the genlock signal itself actually contains this color burst in order to make sure that that timing that timing on all devices for displaying color is perfectly lined up this signal can actually be used on standard definition standard definition as well as high definition in terms of syncing up cameras. That said though, it only works for frame rates that are either 30 or 60. So if you're trying to shoot something in 24 frames per second, uh, it won't work. You won't be able to synchronize. Um, that's another thing I should mention. So the timing signal that you're using to synchronize all your, your hardware has to be at the same frame rate that you're wanting to shoot. So if you're shooting at 29.97 frames per second like I am here, you can put, you can use a timing source that's 29.97 frames per second like this black burst generator. Uh, that same signal can actually be used for 60 frames per second as well. Uh, it was not originally designed for that, but it does work because it is outputting 60 fields per second and high definition devices know how to take that information from these original black burst generators and use that to line up their timing for the high definition 60 frames per second signal as well. All right, here is another device that can actually be used for generating a timing genlock signal. And this is a HyperDeck Studio Mini. So this is a video playback and recorder, uh, but it has on the back reference in and reference out connections. And this device, when no reference is connected to the input, it actually does generate its own reference output and you can use that to chain to other devices in order to make sure that they're all lined up properly. Now you also find the same similar reference in and out on Blackmagic switchers, uh, at least the, the non-mini uh, switchers, so anything above that, uh, and other recorders and sometimes you find it on monitors and other things as well. But I'm using this here today as a way of generating a timing signal a genlock signal because it has that capability and I actually don't own anything else that can do high definition uh, tri-level sync signals.
right now, if we take a look at the signal coming out of this, it is again showing us a black burst signal. And that's the way that this device actually behaves when you first power it up. So even though it would normally be used for standard or for high definition or for UHD, it defaults to outputting black burst, a standard definition signal on the reference output. Now, that all changes when I press, in this case, I have some video clips on, on an SD card that are in 1080p at 29.97. Uh, frames per second so if I press the play button on there that's going to change the nature of the signal with that video playing the device is actually outputting a tri-level sync signal this is a very different signal and it's the signal that we would normally use when we're talking when we're working in high definition or UHD either one so this signal looks very different and we call it tri-level sync because it actually you can see it has three different levels there's a positive there's there's your ground and then there's your negative and this signal is being output for every line of video and if you look down here in the lower right, you can see that it's being output at 33.7 kilohertz. So 33 times, 33,000 times per second, which roughly equates to 1,080 lines of video plus some extra lines times 30 frames per second. So this signal that we're operating right now is specifically for 1080p at 29.97 frames per second. And we would take the signal and connect that into the back of the switcher, connect that into the reference input or a genlock input on cameras, and any playback devices like the HyperDeck Studio Mini, connect that signal to the reference in, and then all those devices will be lined up. Now, in addition to that, I should mention that we know that electrical signals don't travel instantaneously. They travel below the speed of light. And when you're talking about long cable runs, the amount of time that it takes for a signal to run down a cable from your genlock source to a camera and back can be significant and so most of most camera devices that actually have genlock will have the option to adjust that timing a little bit so that you can make sure that, that the signal coming from the camera actually does arrive at the switcher at the appropriate time and not too late based on that length of cable that you have running between those so anyway um, so yes this is a tri-level sync signal it's basically pulses that are output for each scan line and then uh, I'm going to adjust the scope here and let you see what happens at the beginning of a video frame. So the signal I showed you a minute ago was actually the signal that's output for all of the for each new uh, new scan line. So each ver basically horizontal line of video that is part of uh, a, a part of the picture. So that signal on a 1080p signal is outputting roughly 33,000 times per second. So 1080 plus some extra lines for other signal information times 30 frames per second gives you roughly 33,000 33, uh, per second. And what I have on screen here is basically five or yeah, five of those pulses uh, for starting new lines, but you can see that there are some of them there that are actually the signal where the signal is staying low. And these are the pulses that are used for starting a new frame of video. In fact, if I zoom out a little bit, you can see that there's five of them. So there's five lines uh, where that signal stays low, and that basically tells any connected device, I need you to start the top of a video frame right now. So the cameras that are attached will see that and know that it's time to start a new frame, and then whenever it sees uh, the pulse without that low signal, it knows that it needs to output a new line a new row of video so but that's basically the gist of tri-level sync so it's a signal that's being generated by some device and sent to all your cameras and switcher in order to make sure that all of them are generating the same portion of the video picture at the same time one of the advantages to having genlock is not only is the picture information arriving at a switcher at the same time it also makes sure that all of your cameras are outputting the exact same number of frames over the same period of time so even though we have our cameras set to 29.97 or 50 frames per second or whatever that timing is not perfect and you'll find that if you're recording over 10 20 30 minutes an hour or whatever several hours that your cameras even though they might even be the same model might drift apart from one another and like by the end of an hour you might find that one camera is output five frames more than another having genlock actually prevents that so if you're in a situation where you do have drift you need to line up multiple cameras in post-production. It really helps to have cameras genlocked. Now, not all cameras have genlock. In fact, the cameras that I'm using here, the cameras that I normally use as part of doing my video production, don't have genlock. 
And so that's a situation that we kind of have to deal with. If you're dealing with a camera that does not have the Genlock capability, you're going to see some drift. And you'll have to figure out a way to deal with that. And very often what I do is I speed, up, speed it up or slow it down. But yeah, with Genlock, that wouldn't be a requirement. So you would always know for sure that all of your cameras and your switcher output are basically outputting at the same exact rate and it will experience no drift over time whatsoever. So what does it actually look like when it comes time to connect a camera to a Genlock source? Here I have an Ursa Mini 4K and it has on the side a combination reference in and time code in. You don't normally see devices do that on one single connector but the Ursa Minis do. So you use one connector to either do a Genlock signal or time code. And I'll get to the time code portion in a little bit. For right now, we're going to connect in the time reference output from the HyperDeck Studio Mini into the reference in on the camera. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to what you what, what you see the video coming out of the camera and as I connect this signal to the reference in after a bit of time, you'll see on screen There we go. So you notice right here, it says ref. And so this camera right now is locked to the timing information coming out of my HyperDeck Studio Mini. So you have to make sure that you are at least on the same frame rate and depending on the device, you might have to be in the same resolution as, as well. So right now, my HyperDeck is playing at 1080p 29.97, and my Ursa Mini is actually set at Ultra HD 2160p at 29.97 frames per second, but it was still able to walk to that reference. So depending on what device you're using, you might be able to use a high-definition source to sync a 4K camera, but you, we know we can also use standard-definition black bursts in order to sync a camera as well. So if I was to substitute in my black burst generator here instead of the HyperDeck, it would the camera would still be able to sync. But at this point, we know that the camera is outputting at the exact same frame rate as our sync, our Genlock source. All right, just one other quick demonstration. I've got my black burst generator hooked up again. This time, I've got it hooked up to a video input on this old school analog uh, video monitor. And so, if I actually switch, as I mentioned, if I switch over to that input. You'll see very briefly that it says 480i. So it is, it thinks it's receiving a video signal when really it's just a Gen Lock signal, Blackbird signal. One other thing I wanted to point out before I put this monitor away, uh, on, the, on the, a lot of the old school professional video monitors, they would have this jack here, which is an external synchronization input. And you would connect your Blackbird signal to that. And that way you could actually check to see if your video input signal coming in on the input was in time with the Genlock signal. So you connect your video input on the input one, connect your Genlock on the external sync, and then you press the external sync button on the front, and that causes the monitor to ignore the timing information from the video input and use the external sync instead. And if your picture looked right, the, it wasn't out of sync, it wasn't in the wrong position, and the colors were correct, you knew that that video source was actually timed correctly uh, and the Genlock was working. In our modern HD and UHD digital world. We don't have to worry about that external st sync stuff anymore, but it's kind of interesting to know where we came from. All right, with Genlock out of the way, let's talk about time code. This is another synchronization signal, but it's very different, and people do tend to get the two confused. So if you've been paying attention, you may notice that I've had this monitor going over here and it's displaying time code down at the bottom. That time code is coming out of my ATEM 2ME Production Studio switcher. So that, time, that switcher is generating time code. So what is time code? It's actually just a number which tells you how many hours, minutes, seconds, and frames have elapsed from some arbitrary point in time. That point in time might be the time we powered on a switcher, like in the case here, saying it's been on for one hour, 15 minutes, 36 seconds, and zero frames or whatever. Or it might be since we started recording, 
or it could be uh, uh, it could be the time of day, or it could be some other arbitrary point in time as well. So, for, say for example, if you're shooting a music video, you could use time code to represent how far into the song you are. So at that point, when you're pulling all your footage together and you want to sync it up for editing, it's able to use the time code to make sure that you're always lined up, so that whatever portion of the song the artist is singing at any given portion of time is exactly what you're seeing on screen. So, but that's that's really all the time code is. Time code is not used to adjust the timing of anything inside of the camera other than a clock that's displayed and that time is recorded as part of the beginning of each frame of video. So that said, let's take a look at some examples of time code. So we, first of all, we got this one that's over here and this time code is coming from my switcher. I'm gonna switch over to my camera here and you can see that it's out that's showing time code as part of the indicators there at the top of the screen. So in this case, uh, it's been 18 minutes and 44 seconds since I powered on the camera. And that's basically just counting up. And it's continuing to count up over time. So you're seeing that hours, minutes, seconds, and frames. I'm running at 2160p at 29.97 frames per second. And so you see that the frame number there is going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., up through 29. And that's resetting back down to zero. So therefore, you're seeing that it's running at 30 frames per second. Now, if you adjust your frame rate, that number will change. If you're shooting 24 frames per second, it will go up to 23 and then reset back to zero. Uh, there's one big exception to that, and that is when you go to frame rates that are higher than 30 frames per second. So if you're shooting at 50 or 60 or even 48 or whatever, SMPTE time code does not actually support that. And so we've kind of had to do a little bit of a workaround in order to accurately represent the number of frames when we're shooting at frame rates higher than 30. And this ends up working out okay because with old old school analog video, it was even though it was 30 frames per second or in the case of a lot of the rest of the world, 25 frames per second, it was interlaced video and each one of those frames had an upper field and a lower field. And cameras are able to take advantage of that and so if we're, say, looking, if we're on frame 48 out of 60, the time code would show 24 frames, and then it would be the upper field. And, if, and then when you get to the next, next frame of video, uh, frame number 49, that becomes the lower field of frame number 24. So it's tricky, but it actually does work out. So we're still able to use that old system with modern video equipment, even though our frame rates are considerably higher than what SMPTE timecode was actually designed to handle. How is timecode transmitted from one device to another? Well, there's a couple ways that are used commonly today. And the one that I'm using to display timecode over here, uh, that's embedded in the SDI video signal that's coming out of my switcher. So it's just part of that digital signal. It's stored as some of that binary data, that digital data that's coming out of the of the switcher. So as part of that SDI video stream, there are some bits in there that are basically saying, I am currently on one hour, five minutes, 36 seconds, and 13 frames, or whatever. But the other way we actually do this is with audio of all things. And so SMPTE timecode has something that's called LTC, or linear timecode, which can be used to represent that SMPTE timecode information. And for devices that don't have native support for timecode, like the cameras that I use here for my channel and that I happen to use for my productions, they don't have a timecode input. But we can still take advantage of the fact that we can use timecode because timecode can be represented as an audio signal. Now, I'm gonna let you hear some of that and a few bonus points to anybody who actually decodes this information. All right, so what you just heard there, that is SMPTE timecode expressed as format. It's called linear timecode. And we can embed that into any device that can record audio. And I'm gonna do a video here really soon where I sh demonstrate how to take advantage of that in order to sync up cameras that don't support a timecode input. Not just not just cameras, but audio, uh, audio sources as well. So stay tuned and, and make sure you subscribe to the channel in order to watch that video because it's going to be very interesting. I'm going to dem demonstrate some techniques that are not commonly used in order to distribute time code to devi multiple devices on a, in a very budget-friendly manner without having to make a heavy investment in equipment and then use that time code information to sync up multiple video clips and audio in your video editor. So stay tuned for that.
Now, other devices like this camera actually do have timecode inputs. And so if we take a look here on the side, a little bit hard to see, but the third BNC connector down here, it says ref in TC in and TC in means timecode in. And so this camera actually knows how to receive one of those SMPTE timecode signals, the LTC audio signals on that input, and then it will basically override its internal timecode information with that information so that your camera is recording the same timecode information as everything else. I'm going to connect that up and actually show you what that looks like. Now, as mentioned, linear timecode is just an audio signal. And so what I've done is I've actually put the timecode output of my video switcher, my ATEM switcher, on a Dante input on my network. And so I'm able to take that timecode time code data and then distribute that anywhere I want. So I've got here an Audinate AVO or AVIO adapter, and this is set to receive that audio signal coming from that, that device. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this cable, XLR on one side, uh, and then RCA on the other, plug in that output, and then I have to use an RCA to BNC adapter. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this BNC connector, I'm going to plug that into the TC timecode input on the camera, and pay close attention to what's going on up here near the top of the screen on the camera. We're going to see some changes happen there right away. So I plug in the signal. And bingo, there we go. So now the camera is using the timecode information that's output for my switcher through my Dante network in order to timestamp all of the recordings that I'm going to make. So you'll see that, that time value there is 1 hour 26 minutes, which basically indicates how long it's been since my switcher was turned on, not how long it's been since my camera was turned on. And this is what we call jam syncing. And what I can do at this point is actually even disconnect this, and the camera will still keep counting at that same time code. So even without an active signal, the camera will keep going. If I turn off the camera, it, it, start, it will reset and start over, but as long as I leave the power of the camera turned on, once I've given it a time code signal, it will continue counting in that same time code. And therefore, it will stay at least relatively in close sync with the other devices that are part of my video network. But this is where I have to kind of point out some of the caveats associated with using timecode. Because timecode is not adjusting the video timing within the camera, they will still get out of sync. If you got a camera that instead of outputting exactly 29.97 frames per second or recording 29.97 frames per second, it does 29.98 frames per second. Over time, it's still going to drift out of sync with your other cameras. So time code allows you to line up the beginning of video clips in your editor, but it doesn't do anything whatsoever for making sure that over time they, they stay in sync. That's where Genlock comes in. So if you need your cameras to always stay exactly lined up, you still need Genlock, and then time code can be used to line up the positions on the timeline of the different clips so that you're seeing the same video from the same point in time when it was recorded. So in that way, timecode is very useful for editing, but it does absolutely nothing for making sure that over time, cameras and whatnot stay in sync. So they actually work separately and together in order to make sure that your timing on your devices, your video, your audio, etc. actually lines up. So yeah, very interesting. Now I'm gonna show you one more example of hooking up a device for timecode and with another camera. All right, so this camera, the Sony PXW-X70, does not have a timecode input on it. So what we have to do is we have to use other methods in order to get timecode in there. So what I'm gonna use here, I'll show you this from above here. This is a device called a tentacle sync. Uh, this is a little timecode generator. Uh, it also has the ability to sync to an external timecode. And that does that through an, in, an input here on the bottom. Again, time code is just audio, so it's really easy to, to uh, use normal cables in order to produce that. So right now, uh, with it flashing in the green mo mode right here, it's actually generating time codes. What I can do is use the included cable, take the output of that, and then plug that into the microphone input on the side of the camera here. So at this point, even though the camera's internal time code doesn't match the time code that's on the tentacle sync, that audio, that audio signal is being recorded on the left channel of the audio, and then we can use a piece of software in order to decode that and then turn that into a matching time code for all the other devices that we have. So in that way, we're able to include time code on any device that doesn't support it, even audio recorders. So very often when working in film, 
uh, a guy who's doing audio will use a device like this or a recorder that actually natively supports timecode and record a separate track on the audio recorder that includes just the timecode information. And then in post-production, you're able to decode that audio signal, that linear timecode signal, use that to modify the metadata for the file, and then your video editor can use that to line up all your different, all your different sequences from all your different sources. I should mention that this camera actually does have some timecode capabilities, but it does not have the ability to sync to an external timecode. So if we go into the, the menu here, it's, we can display timecode, we can set a preset, but we're not able to take that from, from an external source. So essentially that makes this, this uh, timecode feature on the camera next to worthless, in my opinion. Now, not all equipment out there has timecode inputs and outputs on it. So like for the Blackmagic ATAM switcher line, the 2ME production studio and the 4ME production studio have timecode inputs and outputs on XLR connectors, but their other switchers do not. So it really varies, and some products have that capability and others do not. You'll also find it included on two different types of connectors. So it's an audio, so you very often find it on XLRs, but you'll also find it on BNC connectors as well, as mentioned earlier when, we, when I was displaying timecode on my Ursa Mini. That one has an, a BNC connection for the timecode input on that. They're the same signal, it's just on a different connector, and so you're able to use some very inexpensive cables in order to adapt from one to the other. The tentacle sync, I mentioned, uses 1 8 inch or 3.5 millimeter jacks, but again, it's just the same signal. Another device that interestingly has timecode capability are some of the Terranex Mini devices from Blackmagic. If we go into the menu on this, the audio menu, and one of the output options, so normally you would output analog audio, but you can you can do AES EBU or you can do timecode and so this device will actually extract the timecode information from the SDI video signal coming in and output that timecode on the on the right channel audio output so if you need to get timecode uh, to a remote location and you don't have something like Dante you can use one of one of these devices to do it now devices that have a timecode input they typically support jam syncing so basically all you should do is it, very temporarily plug in a timecode signal into that input and then the device will reset its timecode to match the signal that's coming in to that input and then it'll continue to increase that time value on its own. That way you can disconnect the timecode uh, input and then keep going. So in, that, in this case what I did with my tentacle sync is I took the output of my tentacle sync, plugged that in the timecode input of my ATAM switcher and all of a sudden now the ATAM switcher is running the exact same timecode as my tentacle sync even though they're no longer connected. Tentacle sync timecode here matches the timecode coming out of my switcher exactly. Now I want to eliminate some of the confusion around timecode. There is something that's called drop frame timecode. Now it's, the name is very confusing, so let me clear that up a little bit. So with NTSC video, instead of running at whole number integer frame rates like 24 and 30, it actually runs at 23.976 or 29.97. Now what that means is the video actually does run a little bit slower than the integer frame rate. Now what happens is if your timecode is not adjusted to make up for that difference, what you'll find is your timecode is slowly drifting over time from what time you actually see on your clock. So what we use is something that's called drop frame. Now no actual video frames are dropped, it's just a way of changing the numbering. So essentially what happens with drop frame is the beginning of every minute except those that are divisible by 10 we just skip the very first two frame numbers. So frame zero and frame one for each minute don't exist. It just skips right over them. So if you're shooting at 29.97, it goes from frame 29 to frame two at minute one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but not minutes zero, 10, 20, and so forth. So it's just a numbering thing. No video information is actually lost. And the reason we do this is to make sure that time code advances more or less at the same frame rate, at the same rate as a real clock. Hopefully that will clear up some of the confusion around Genlock and timecode. They're both synchronization signals, but they serve very different purposes, and one is not a substitute for the other. Very often, if you really want to have signals stay in sync, you want both. Let me mention one other type of technology that's used that's associated with synchronization, and this is specific to audio. And this is called word clock. So when we have digital audio, like AES EBU or AES 3, when you have audio going between multiple different devices, you need for all those devices to be 
synchronized one uh, with one another. Otherwise, you find that when a bit comes in, it's not lined up with when the device is expecting it to, to come in, and all of a sudden the data gets distorted, and you end up with actual audio distortion and or complete loss of signal. The solution for this is something called word clock. So you'll have one device in your audio setup which generates a word clock signal, and then you connect that to the word clock input of all the other devices that have it. That way, everything on your in your audio setup, all your all your audio equipment, is transmitting and receiving all your audio data, your digital audio data at the same time. It stays in sync, no distortion, no drift. If you start recording on one device at one time, another device uh, at the same time, hours later, those will, those samples will line up perfectly if you're able to use word clock. We're seeing fewer and fewer devices actually support word clock these days. A lot of the times devices are actually able to derive word clock from having a digital input. Uh, in the case of an audio system like I'm using with Dante, the word clock is still there, but it's handled on the Dante network instead of being generated internally in the device. So I should do another video about Dante uh, synchronization and clock signals. But for now, just uh, Remember that when you have multiple digital audio devices communicating digitally, this only applies to digital communication, analog, it doesn't, doesn't uh, come into play at all. But when you have audio devices communicating digitally and they support word clock, you probably should actually connect up the word clock connections between your different devices. And what I've got here is I have, this is a Motu um, Mark of the Unicorn audio interface for a computer, and it happens to have a word clock output on it. So I'm going to show you what that signal actually looks like. All right, here you go. We're looking at... Uh, word clock signal coming out of the Motu and right now I have it set to 48 kilohertz sampling rate and so what we're seeing here is a pulse up down the complete cycle of uh, 48,000 times per second and basically any connected device will know hey this is the rate that I need to be digitizing analog audio and this is the rate I need to be sending audio, uh, sending digital audio out my outputs and so it's a good idea, again, to make sure that if you have word clock support on your devices, that you actually connect it up and use it in order to avoid those digital audio artifacts that can happen when things get out of sync. Now, how do these actually relate to one another? Well, in a fully functioning studio, you'll have either one device that's generating all of these signals, your gen lock, your time code, and or word clock, or devices that are synchronized with one another that are doing so. That way, it doesn't matter what device you're recording on, what you're, uh, whether it's audio or video or whatever, when it comes time to actually sync those things up in editing, there's no trouble doing so because everything was recording at the same rate. Frames last the exact same amount of time. The amount number of frames recorded over a period of time is exactly the same across all your devices. Your audio doesn't drift. Your video doesn't drift. Everything lines up perfectly. So in a broadcast facility, that's very much the way that they handle that. They'll have a master sync device, master clock. that generates those signals, and then those are distributed to all the equipment. So for those who have the budget to do so, it's a great thing to do. But if you don't, uh, you may find yourself running into signal drift issues. So anyway, I'm going to do a future video here pretty soon on this channel where I walk through the process of using time code to sync up video from multiple cameras as well as a video switcher. So make sure you're subscribed to watch that. That'll be coming pretty soon. I plan on doing that here in the next week or two. Uh, but I'll go walk through the whole process and demonstrate some ways of getting time code to cameras and whatnot that are kind of unconventional and probably save you some money as compared to buying dedicated hardware specifically for that purpose. So. Anyway, that's going to do it for right now. So if you have any questions about Genlock or Timecode or Word Clock or anything related to those, you can leave those in the comment section down below this video. Or better yet, join me over on my Discord channel, djp.li slash Discord. And I will have a channel set up there specifically talking about synchronization signals. And so you can ask your question there. And uh, you'll be able to receive answers from not just me, but other people who work in video production and some of which have more experience than I do and can better answer the questions than I'm able to as well. So, so if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I do video production related content about once a week. If you want even more than that, you can sign up as a paying member of the channel through the join button down below or join me over here on Patreon. And this quick link for that is djp.li slash Patreon. So that's going to do it for now. So thanks everyone for watching and have a fantastic day.